Josh, welcome to be my first guest. I know many of us, like myself, know you from Park Tuesday, uh, but we don't know much more than that. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. So, yeah, I'm obviously I do Harp Tuesday. Started that ten years ago now, and uh, I've been playing the harp for thirty years. It started when I was thirteen. Uh, started playing professionally two years after that when I was fifteen, uh, gigging in background music and stuff like that, and then started playing in orchestras in 1994, and doing recitals. And started traveling and touring a little bit later than that. Um, and so that's, uh, that's been a large part of what I do is, is doing solo concerts and as well as teaching and that, especially the teaching kind of has s taken off with the advent of Harp Tuesday because that the place that I live in Victoria doesn't have a huge population to draw from in terms of teaching, but now doing teaching online, which of course everyone's doing now, uh, allowed me to really expand my teaching horizons that way. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I continue to do. I, I love solo harp music and playing it. And, and um, that's a big focus. Of course, this last year has taken a bit of a break, but, uh, and teaching as well. So I don't know, that's, that's what I do. That's who I am. Yeah, so if you're interested in knowing Josh Hat origin story, watch Harp Tuesday episode 200, where he tells you the story in a lot more detail. I myself start watching Harp Tuesday and then when you mention that you teach, I'm like, yes, I want to play like this guy. I'm going to take lessons from him. So why don't we start talking about teaching? Because we see it in Harp Tuesday. We, we kind of get a sense of how you teach, but we didn't really know, you know, from the other perspective, what is it like to be a harp teacher? What, what propels you to want to be a harp teacher? Why do you want to teach? Right. Um, well, yes. I, I, it's, it's an interesting question, right? And I think that it's funny because my dad was a teacher, right? That was his profession, um, elementary school for the most part. And so maybe there's partly that family history. But I like to think about how things work. I like to try and figure out how things work. So teaching, one of the things about teaching is trying to be able to explain how things work. And I, I love trying to do that. And just of course, trying to, I guess, I love the harp and I love music so much to try and share that with other people. So I find it, I find it very satisfying. I think some people just naturally enjoy teaching maybe more than others. And obviously also maybe the experiences that you've had. So I had a wonderful harp teacher and that probably also influenced me in terms of how I might view teaching. Um, and I think as a teacher, so it's interesting because I think a lot of the time, maybe our picture of a teacher is a, is a school teacher where a lot of the time you're maybe running crowd control and you're certainly not able to give a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual attention. So that's something that's so amazing about teaching music is you get to do that one-on-one, -on -one, right? And in that role, many things, right? So sometimes you're trying to give specific instructions maybe physical instructions or maybe phrasing louder here or softer here that I couldn't hear that note as much as I would like that wasn't even um, you're also a cheerleader right because sometimes it's just nice to have somebody else who shares this same passion or this same instrument right so for with harp because it's relatively rare it, many people they might be the only ones they know playing the harp so to have someone else to kind of just share that uh, instrument and the challenges and the successes that they have is, is wonderful. And a resource, a guide, right, is, is a teacher you can help provide suggestions in terms of repertoire and uh, answer questions. Of course, we have the internet now for answering questions, but sometimes there's nothing the same as having a question being able to ask somebody because the answer might not come from the question as you had phrased it, right? That question might actually be leading to a different question. and. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I really enjoy all those aspects of, of teaching. Um, does that, yeah, does that make sense? Does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah, and I, I certainly get a, a sense of your fondness of troubleshooting <laughs> in yes, Harp exactly. Tuesday afternoon, exactly. right? Uh, I think we talk about your, your uh, 
there's one episode where you talk about playing two against three and you have this right. sprinkling and, and I thought that was a really cool visual. Yeah. And um, certainly I think a lot of people who are good at doing something don't necessarily make a good teacher, right? And sometimes someone who is a good teacher doesn't necessarily mean they are particularly fond of the topic either, right? So finding that happy marriage between the two, I think it's a, it's a really good combo. That's, that's very true, because I think certainly in music, right, if, if it's always been easy for you, it can make it harder to teach because you never had to deal with those challenges that maybe somebody else does. Um, so be, I think for me, with my analytical type of thinking that I really enjoy, that helps combat that sense because harp did come very easily to me. But I also enjoy looking back and thinking, OK, why? Why does this? Why does this work? Why doesn't this work? Um, but yes, I mean, the best the best at doing something doesn't mean that you're the best at teaching it and uh, and vice versa. Yeah, sure. Did you start Hop Tuesday around the same time you start teaching? Is there a correlation between the two in terms of the timing? I, 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 I had already been teaching for a, a number of years, but not at all in the same volume that then arose out of Harp Tuesday. So, uh, and of course, I mean, Harp Tuesday is a little bit different than teaching because it is a monologue, right? You don't get that sort of interaction and, and response with, from somebody else. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I probably taught my first lesson when I was in my mid twenties. Um, but yes, Harp Tuesday really sort of skyrocketed the amount of teaching that I was doing. And I think the, the fact that we get to kind of see how you teach, right, before we commit to a teacher, I think that's really cool. Because for me, I know personally, I'm very picky in terms of who I want to well, study with, right? That's, yeah, that's a good point, because I, I myself as well, that it's, 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 it's a very, that one-on-one, -on -one, right, is a, is, a, is, a, is a relationship, and it's easy to end up with voices in your head that you don't want, right? So I know lots of people who have studied music in the past and maybe come to the harp later or whatever, but but just they maybe hear a former teacher saying, oh, you know, you can't count or you don't have good rhythm or you can't sight read well or whatever. And those voices stick. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship not to be entered into lightly. And, and for sure, I think having something such as Harp Tuesday yeah, 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 gives you a pretty good idea of, of what I'm gonna be like, um, which, is, which is definitely helpful. Yeah, and so you have been teaching online for a long time now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, since, well, since mid, since 2011, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2011. So, I mean, for me, I didn't really want to study something online prior to the pandemic, right. really, because I always get this impression that that's not necessarily the most effective. Yeah. And then, of course, when COVID came, uh, I thought, okay, well, it's not like I can see anyone locally either, so I kind of... Yeah. So, okay, whatever, I'm going to open up to it. So for, for viewers who are considering taking lessons but don't have teachers locally and they're wondering, you know, does online lesson work? What would you tell them about uh, online teaching? Experience? Online teaching, yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, I would say, of course, I'm not doing any in-person teaching right at the moment, but when I have, I would say 95% of the time I wasn't really aware of, as I was teaching, thinking that, oh, this is an in-person lesson or this is a online lesson that a little, most of what I do at least doesn't matter. Um, and uh, again, I think probably lots of people are now aware of it, but but it's amazing how you kind of forget that you're in your little room and somebody else is in their room, that it feels as if you're both in the same room. So uh, I do think there are definitely aspects where it's a lot easier in person. So playing along with people, some rhythm stuff because there is that delay. And for, for, for young kids, I think it's, it's, it's much more challenging. Um, but I don't know, I guess I just, if, if it's something you think you might at all be interested in, it's certainly worth trying because mm -hmm. I think it is potentially really amazing and does allow you to have lessons no matter where you are. For sure, because like, especially the harp is not very popular, right? So even finding a teacher sometimes can be a challenge. So. For sure, right? For sure. And that's where, yeah, that's where <laughs> the internet and, and online lessons has really opened that up to be able to 
to have that because at one point there was a Sylvia Woods teach yourself video and that was kind of it if you wanted to try and learn on your own and now you've got so many YouTube videos and then also the ability to have online lessons. Mm -hmm. Would you consider doing group lesson ever or do you think HARP works better one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, so I've, I've done some group stuff um, in the past, mainly in person. Um, and it's something I definitely am considering and playing around with various various ideas. Music in general, I think, is set up to work really well one-on-one -on -one because then you can give that, again, that idea of feedback, right? Which is so amazing of somebody doing something and immediately at that right moment getting feedback that, oh, change this or do this different or, or whatever. Um, and so it's harder in a group. And I guess for myself, I'm not a big group learning person. Um, but there, and again, that's where like in person is nice because then you can do maybe some, some ensemble stuff where you are all playing together. But I think there are lots of, lots of potentially interesting possibilities for group stuff. In the classical world, there's the idea of the master class, right? A bit of a pretentious title, but where somebody comes in and uh, listens to performances and offers feedback for the while the audience is watching, right? So that the individual is getting individual feedback, but it's also kind of tailored for uh, an external audience as well. And sometimes those are less useful, and sometimes those are more useful. But uh, for me, I like I like that. That's a uh, definitely something I enjoy doing. I certainly get it. Can use that. The feedback, and I was really surprised by how much you're able to pick up through the internet. Because when I have my lessons with you, I'm on my laptop, which the camera is not the best. But you're able to pick up stuff that I thought oh, I can just get away with it. Josh will notice, and you totally notice it. So that was pretty amazing. And and I think you're right in terms of the feedback, right? Because I, I everyone plays so differently, and everyone's mm. going to need different kind of guidance. So I think. You know, in a way, you're right. Like music is really optimized for that sort of one-on-one. -on -one. One-on-one, yeah, yeah. Now, talk. Speaking of ensemble, you mentioned you have played in an orchestra in your <laughs> intro. What What was that like? Like, is is that is that something you have always wanted to do? To be in an orchestra, play with no, others? No, because I mean, for me again, I, I I sort of got into the harp listening to a lot of Celtic music and didn't have any particularly clear ideas. Um, and then as I got drawn into the classical world, it was more the solo solo harp stuff that was particularly appealing. Um, so. I, I don't have a permanent orchestra position, right? Uh, Victoria is fairly small. The one professional orchestra here has a harpist who's been here for years. But I freelance around. I've done a lot of orchestral playing in various different orchestras. Um, and it's, uh, it's the type of thing that I really enjoy doing a certain amount of, but I don't see myself doing that full time ever. The harp in the orchestra often is counting a lot of rests. It's like, okay, one, 100, 200, you know, 200 rests, and oh, then you play a little bit, and the brass are playing, and you can't even hear it. So there are certainly, I think, for example, as a violinist, where you're playing so much of the time, that potentially has a lot more job satisfaction in terms of playing in an orchestra. Ballet orchestras or opera orchestras are, are pretty good for harp because there's a lot of harp in some of that music, so that, that can be quite nice. And uh, that being said, it's, it's an amazing experience, right? Just the sound of a full orchestra, right? We so often we're listening on our little headphones and, and or on our smartphone speakers, but to be in real life and, and hear the from the pianissimo to the huge, loud sounds that a real orchestra can create is amazing. And to be a part of that, right? And to contribute to that and, and just the coordination of, of, you know, anywhere from 40 to 80 or more people doing these very precise things in a very precise way all together and the the sort of the, the training that goes into being able to in a professional orchestra put together a piece in in one or two rehearsals that's you know that maybe people have never played before but the whole system of music and training is such that all these people with all their various parts can read that and come together and rehearse and perform um, so yeah, I mean, the, the great things about orchestras, less satisfying things sometimes, uh, particularly for harp as well. Um, 
but they're yeah they're quite uh, i certainly have enjoyed all the orchestra playing that i've done and will continue to enjoy it and and uh speaking of sort of preparing for a performance you perform uh, a lot too in solo concerts and whatnot um tell us a little bit about preparing to perform i'm interested in hearing it because i oftentimes would hear people say well i'm gonna master this thing you know in a week or in a month right and then mm. you know, looking at myself I'm, i have been working on a piece with you for uh three months <laughs> and i see many more months to come so um when i listened to say your last concert the winter solstice celebration right. there was a, a pretty wide selection of music there and granted some of them you might already know already and yeah. not, but I, i have a feeling that that talks to you more than one month <laughs> to figure out so what goes behind the scene when you're performing or preparing for a performance like how, how do you get ready and how long does that take yeah it's gonna, again it's going to vary yeah exactly so the difficulty of the piece and whether you've performed it before right and also sort of the timeline so um for me my ideal timeline let's say i'm putting together a concert of solo harp music on the pedal harp you know virtuoso level harp music um i would want to give myself ideally maybe a year to prepare that if if those pieces are new um and definitely at least six months even if some of those pieces are ones i played before just because it, it that gives you plenty of time gives you to 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 really settle into the piece and particularly a piece that is new it's one thing to first have learned the notes and maybe you can give a pretty good performance of it but then just living with it and playing it day after day it evolves right it grows and you really start to know it in a different way and be able to i think give a, a better performance of it um so that's always kind of my ideal time frame six months to a year out now that's not always the case it's not always possible i remember being asked to do the it's a beautiful concerto by carl reinica um fantastic harp concerto and be asked to do that in i think maybe three months time or something like that so I never played it before and great learn it and and prioritize that then in terms of practice um but i would have loved to have lived with it even longer right like the performance was fine but uh, um and on that solstice concert one of the pieces i played was the handel harp concerto which is, uh, again i've been playing that for almost 94 16 years or something like that is that right yeah 16 years 26 years that's better 26 years um and many performed it many times and and so even though i hadn't played that one i brought it back in about two weeks right i only worked on that in two weeks just because i knew it so well the fingers and i find especially those pieces that you learned when you were younger they stick with you in a way that maybe something that i learned when i was 35 doesn't always stick quite the same way um and so it's it's that process of first kind of getting the notes all together finding the piece and maybe then memorizing it and then starting to really have it live with you right so that it so that it feels as if it's part of you and that you have something to say with it and 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 um uh, and obviously getting close the closer you get to the date right of, of when you're the first performance trying to do those things such as video yourself pr pretend to perform right um do a mini performance for friends and family all those things because no matter how you've prepared it's always different that first performance and i really noticed that on tours right that that uh, by the end of the tour those pieces are in such different shape than they were at the beginning of the tour even though it's been a relatively short time compared to the amount of time I've been working on them because that that sort of sharpening by being performed or, or honing the performance in, in a concert setting is different I think than than what you can do in a practice setting so talk, talk to us about living with the music because one of the things I really appreciate looking at you perform and and I haven't seen you perform live other than in the online concert but I've watched plenty of videos you and what i get is a sense of you really connecting to the music you're so in one with your instrument and music sure. 
I would be happy if I can just hit the right note <laughs> at the right time at the right speed, right? So what what does that take to to tip you over to the point where yes, I understand this music. I can I I'm I'm playing the music, I'm not letting the music play me. Like what what, what are some of the, the the tips and tricks that we can uh, keep in mind when we're preparing to perform? Like how do we get over that hump of I can barely play to yes, I can do this well. Yeah, and obviously some of that is is some of that is uh, technical, right? Just that the better you get at playing the harp, the easier it is to let the mechanics take care of themselves, right? And um, and so for me, ideally, when I'm playing, I'm hearing the sound that's going to happen in my head, right? I'm anticipating that, and I'm not really having to think about the fingers. I'm just by thinking the sound, it will happen, right? That that the yeah, that ex idea of the, the the instrument becoming an extension of your of your body just from so many years of, of practice. Um, I also and again just that idea of time, right? So that even a very very simple piece, like very very simple, to play that perfectly, like really beautifully with fantastic volume control and phrasing, is very challenging and so it's not a case of okay to start with i can play this level piece perfectly and then i can play this level and then i can play this level and I, as you get better it's that we have to polish our technique to a certain extent before we can maybe really have that amazing control over every note and i noticed that for myself just messing around the piano i'm not a, i'm not a particularly good pianist but I, I can play a little bit and just the ability so on the harp i don't even have to if i know what volume level i want a note to be it will be that volume level on the piano i can know what volume i want that note to be but whether it comes out that way or not is much more hit or miss right. um so but in terms of things you know actionable things that one can do the idea of recording yourself, I think, is just so, so helpful. Record yourself and then listen back, for example, uh, listening for, okay, volume level. I want to listen for volume level. If I played a wrong note or I had to stop or whatever, that's fine, but I want to listen for the volume level. Was there anything that stood out? Did I want this to taper down a little bit? Should this have been softer? And write some notes to yourself on, on the music so that you have something to hang on to, right? Something it's easy, and I know I'm, I tend to be guilty of this, right, to kind of talk about the big concept of, oh, this should be the feeling we want to achieve, but sometimes what we want is just the nuts and bolts of, it should it be louder, softer, faster, slower, right, of, of, of really specific stuff that makes a, a big difference. So trying to, trying to locate those and, and trying to improve those and, and up that consistency, right, of I want this note to be this volume level, maybe it's that 50% of the time, and then it's 60, and then 70, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even, I mean, the technique building itself takes time too, right? Because I remember some of the pieces that we have started or you helped me start early in our lesson that like, I, I mean, I guess stumble it through, but when I play it now, but now that I have better techniques, it comes mm -hmm. off usually a lot better. Yeah. Uh, so I can, I think uh, I can see why you want to start practicing something a year ahead of time. Yeah. Right? Just to say, I think yeah. as a society, we, we, we have this, feeling that you know we should just be able to get this done sooner rather than later so i think often like i know when i started the harp i tend to just want to rush it right and I thought, you know, if, I, if i brute force this <laughs> give it enough tries i'll get there but it doesn't always work out that way no for sure and i think that's again i i, I really appreciate that mindset through learning music that idea of, of 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 the long term being much longer than 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 next week right so that yeah being aware that it, it okay i i hear this isn't as good as i would like it and i want it to get better and i have an idea of how to make it get better and i'm going to do that but it doesn't mean it's going to get better <laughs> tomorrow type of thing oh. and again just trying to uh, trying to go back to an experience on the piano because uh, that's something where there was a working on a piece with a our, can you, let's see, an arpeggio like a big maybe 12 note arpeggio or something like that and that just the first time i played it i from my experience playing the harp i was able to immediately recognize that this technique 
was going to be something that was going to take me at least six months to even start to have it sound good, right? So no matter how much I practiced and all the, you know, all the smart ways that I would really knew to practice it, it just, to have it start to feel as fluid as I would like, I, I, it was just going to take time in addition to all these other things. Yeah. You know, my, my husband like to always remind me that, you know, your teacher has been doing this for 30 years. So uh, if you want to start now half as good as your teacher, give yourself 15. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that's important to keep that in mind too. Exactly. It's not something you can rush. Um, is there any performances that are more memorable for you in, in the many years you've been performing? One that just uh, popped to mind right now is actually a performance from 2002, I think. So I <laughs> I went on this adventure. I shipped my harp to Southern Ontario and I set up a series of concerts there, the Traveling Harpist Project. And this was back before social media and, 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 and uh, yeah, so kind of a big experiment. I didn't get big audiences, but I particularly remember one concert in, I think it was Oak, Oakville, just outside of Toronto. So this small little venue, small little crowd, but they were so enthusiastic. And just, just the, again, that amazing energy that you can get back from an audience. And yeah, that one, that one really stands out. Um, I remember some concerts in in Brazil, in, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, been to the Rio Harp Festival four times, I think. Um, and that's just quite a different uh, setting. J just the, this is the first time I've been to South South America. So just the, I guess we are, we're a tropical rainforest here, but not quite the same tropical rainforest as, as Brazil and, uh, yeah, again, super enthusiastic audiences. Um, thinking of also some of the European concerts. I remember doing a concert uh, organized by a friend one of my first times in Europe. So this would have been 2007, I want to say. Harping Through History. Yeah, that was a good program. And yeah, I just being driven through these narrow streets and then and arriving and and this was in Germany and Bavaria and the audience just seemed so knowledgeable about classical music and it was a really wonderful wonderful experience there um, yeah another early one in Redding California that was that was great I remember I remember that so yeah nothing you know no no sort of like oh this was the best ever because because i i just in general enjoy performing um and uh, but those are a couple of ones that pop to mind right now well hopefully you'll get to hit the row again when uh we're all definitely safe, uh, definitely pandemic vaccines are being rolled out so there's hope yeah do you have plans to do more virtual concert in the next little bit before we absolutely yeah i'm working on a program right now so and again because i'm doing a half program and uh, not a full hour it, it, um, and reusing some pieces. So it's going to hopefully be one new piece, but a, a couple pieces that I've played before, which allows me to have that slightly shorter time frame. So maybe February, maybe March, uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Thank you for watching the first episode of Heart Connection. That was part one of two of my interview with Josh, who is also my heart teacher. Josh has recently started a YouTube channel called Harpist in the Wild, it is a marriage between his love for the harp and his love for the outdoors. There's a link in the video description box along with his other social media information. So check them out and hit subscribe. If you're new to Josh music and you're wondering what to play, here's a couple of my favorites. There is the five solo for Lever Harps, which is for advanced, beginner, and intermediate player. And it includes Josh's original composition for Captain Summer, which is a very lovely piece to play. There's also his transcription for Lieber Harps for intermediate and advanced player, which include the famous Bach Toccata in D minor. And you can find his arrangements and original compositions such as Fantasy of Green Sleeves and Skybo Song, as well as the Uncharted Shores in the web store as well. 
He has music videos for most, if not all, of those pieces that I have mentioned, so you can check it out in his channel. I hope you enjoy. I'll see you back here in a week to listen to part two of my interview with Josh.